On behalf of the Research Center for German and Austrian Exile Studies, closely associated with the Institute of Modern Languages Research at the University of London, greetings and a very warm welcome to everyone to, to this evening's seminar, which is debating the zeitgeist and being second generation. There will be an opportunity for questions and answers later. So please mute your machines and switch off your cameras because it'll make a huge difference to the quality of, of the actual seminar itself. And send messages later, not at present, please, because it's very distracting. So it is my very great pleasure to introduce both speakers. Instead of one, we have two this evening. Miriam David is Professor Emerita of Sociology of Education at University College London, Institute of Education. She is renowned for her feminist scholarship and is the daughter of a German Jewish refugee who came to England. Marilyn Moose is a child of anti-Nazi refugees who fled Germany early on. She grew up in Durham, attended Oxford University, and since retirement as a lecturer, has written a number of books, both about the second generation and about re resistance to the Nazis. Though unwell, she is very gallantly persevering this evening. So a special thanks to you, Marilyn. It's now my pleasure to invite Miriam David, who will speak first. Thank you very much, Miriam. Thank you, uh, Jana. And uh, thank you, Jane, for uh, pr presenting my uh, slides. Uh, I feel very privileged uh, to have put together this book and also very proud of it. It's very much uh, one of my uh, passions. And what I want to do briefly this evening is give you a flavour and taste of what the book is about and hope that you will be intrigued and interested to uh, read it in full. Next slide, please, Jane. The book's been published by Valentine Mitchell and came out a few weeks ago. It has a foreword by Alf Dubbs, and we're absolutely delighted that he was willing to write because his stellar work for refugees in the 21st century. Our aim in the book is to give voice to 12 British-born children of refugees from Nazism, what are called the second generation. And the specific context for our desire to write the book was because of the racist and xenophobic and nationalistic zeitgeist uh, that had been growing up in the 21st century, and in particular, the second decade, and in particular, around the notion of Brexit and the growing inequalities that have occurred uh, in particular with the global pandemic. Uh, what we didn't know then is how continually uh, relevant the pandemic was going to be, and in particular, the issues about Brexit. And today, in particular, with the petrol crisis and the HGV drivers uh, has uh, shown dramatically the uh, inequalities and impact of Brexit. Next slide, please. As you heard, Marilyn and I are both British-born daughters of German Jewish refugees or exiles from Nazism, the so-called second generation. We wanted to explore this concept of the second generation, notions of exile, emigre, or refugee status on our personal and professional lives. We're both socialist feminist activists and educators and are critical of the current racist and xenophobic zeitgeist. Mm. 
And the particular question we were concerned with is, what impact did our parental backgrounds of persecution and or flight and our personal heritage have on our identities and political actions? Does our polit particular political legacy have any inflection in a politically febrile world of globalization, what we call the current zeitgeist? Next slide, please. So how did we design our study? We decided we wanted to reach out to several friends, including through the Association of Jewish Refugees. And we wrote an article in their magazine in December 2019. Originally, we wanted face-to-face -face discussions about what we saw as sensitive to topics about these kinds of uh, life writing and reflexive uh, commentaries. But the COVID-19 pandemic put pay to this. Instead, we sent a list of general questions to the people who wanted to contribute. And we wrote, as we're in the latest stages of our lives, we want to look back as socialists, anti-racists and feminists and how we got to be who we are now personally and professionally. We suspect that our positioning is not typical. Next slide, please. We asked a series of basic questions. We asked people to write about who they were, where from, and in terms particularly of parents from continental Europe, and whether they saw themselves as emigres, in exile, or refugees. And we also wanted to know what experiences our parents had during the Second World War. For example, were they interned? as enemy aliens, or did they fight in the war? Uh, and the whole question of internment uh, was rather hidden whilst we were growing up, but has become much more of a, an issue for uh, research and comment today. We also asked where people were born in the UK and whether it was during the war or afterwards, and where they grew up. And we were also interested in parental values and views, whether our parents were anti-fascist, anti-racist, atheist, secular, Jewish, and or Zionist, socialist, and feminist. And we were also interested in how our parental relationships and what implications they had for their having children and for us having children, and what that how that played out in our present day personal and social relationships. So what were the complex circuits and changes in our adult lives that led us to be uh, the people that we are today? Next slide, please. So what were the communalities and differences in our backgrounds? We are 11 women with one man. One of us women has a very strong anti-Nazi background and no Jewish affiliation whatsoever. We have very varied European backgrounds, Austria and Germany, but also Czechoslovakia, Latvia and Poland. And we have two additional people to uh, the 12 of us, Sophie Herxheimer, had produced a collection of poems called Welcome to England about her German Jewish grandmother's experience, experiences that illustrate the language that many of us grew up with and often its amusing aspects. Although it was not always how we experienced it, but her poems are produced as an appendix or a, a, few, a sample of her poems rather. Uh, and in addition, the late Eric Sanders, who was a first generation refugee from Austria, he wrote to us uh, in response to our letter in the AJR magazine that he wanted to debate the zeitgeist in the Labour Party. And it was incredibly germane to our questions. So we've included his letter to us, which was a mini essay, also as an appendix. Very sadly, he died on September the 1st this year, aged 101, 
almost 102 because his birthday is just would have been December this year. And so he didn't live to see the final publication, but he did see all the contributions. Next slide, please. Uh, so other communalities and differences between us are, several of us have little or no consciousness of being Jewish. Others are steeped in the meanings of being Jewish, whether by religion or culturally, and it's fundamental contestation and argumentativeness, what Alice Bondi, one of our contributors, calls jousting. Uh, Jewish logic and its relation to politics about anti-Semitism, racism, and the general treatment of refugees also played a huge part in people's stories. The other point about our differences is that we have various different family forms that have implications for how we feel about being what is called in the uh, literature nowadays, othered. Four of us are from mixed marriages, that is only one parent escaping Nazism and from continental Europe. And in the other sense too, one or two are from uh, mixed Jewish, non-Jewish marriages and others, Jewish marriages, but from different generations of refugees. Uh, we have great difference in how many siblings we have or whether we're only children. But perhaps one of the uh, things that struck us in particular was five out of the 12 of us are only children. And we wondered whether that was significant. And some of us wrote about its significance to them. And then finally, lots of family secrets that come out of the stories, which may or may not just be to do with being uh, second generation, but secrets about siblings, about divorce, and so on. And all of those are threaded through our stories. Uh, Next slide, please. Meanings of being second generation. There's a huge difficulty of the definition of what it means. We chose to take it as being British born, uh, but two of us were not. Peter Crowe and Innes Newman uh, were, had parents from continental Europe and were refugees, and in particular, Innes's grandfather uh, was a refugee, and she has recently written about his refugee experience in internment. Uh, and uh, both of them arrived as babies or small children. So they were born elsewhere than Britain. Irena was born here, but she was brought up from the age of three in Germany, only returning as an adult to the UK. So that gives a flavour of the difficulty of what it means to be British born, second generation or not. Ten of us then were born in the UK, uh, not mainly in London, but now the majority of us do live in London. There is huge diversity as well amongst us, uh, our parents as to whether they see themselves as exiles or refugees from Nazism. But you are all a grateful, in inverted commas, refugee parents rather than exiles or even emigres. There's huge diversity as how we're brought up as atheists, agnostics or secular or culturally and religiously Jewish. Only a third of us had any Jewish education or knowledge of Judaism, but may, all of us were mainly liberal to left, socialist, and one or two of us had communist political commitments amongst our parents. So, and um, finally, there were large social class differences in our backgrounds and upbringing. Next slide, please. The significance of being second generation was also diverse. Uh, and whether or not we have try to create our own families from these psychologically tumultuous events is very varied. 
some of us mention not having children as relevant, whereas others don't. All of us are college or university educated and mainly had highly educated parents, making us rather atypical. Virtually all of us now are educators involved in further or higher education. Others, librarians or lawyers, and all combine with diverse forms of political activism. It's only slowly for most of us that the significance of being sec second generation has become evident. And in particular, one of the key things that was a problem during the process of putting together the book was trying to persuade people to put themselves center stage and not be second or inferior to our parents as the first generation, and in particular, the kind of victimhood that some might claim. Next slide, please. What we produce then, what we think are rich, varied, passionate, as well as painful stories about our personal heritage. All of us want to reclaim and preserve the memory through activism and or writing. You've already heard about Marilyn's prolific contributions since she retired. Gaby Weiner has also written a wonderful uh, story about her parents and her grandmother called Tales of Loving and Leaving. And I've mentioned already Innes Newman's recent publication about her grandfather's internment in Heighton. Many of us have lodged papers with the Vienna Library or in other archives. In later life, there has been a turn towards a more culturally Jewish stance and writing from this perspective. For example, Claire Ungerson has written a book called 4,000 Men about uh, the men in the Kitchener camp in Sandwich, German Jewish refugees who uh, were brought here in 1939. And what we all want to share are the experience of silence and trauma of being second generation with the children of other refugees and generations and the future generations. Next slide, please. So we all have strong feelings about being children of refugees. The terms emigre or ex exile have little traction. We want to ensure that nothing like Nazism and its deeply embedded anti-Semitism as part of wider racism ever happens again. But the silences and traumas are also very important in our, the stories, as is the question of intergeneration uh, trauma. Our heritage gives us a feeling of being distinct and being othered, but we are united by our heritage to ensure a political leg legacy of contesting the racist and nasty zeitgeist deepened by the pandemic. Many of us, for example, because of that, chose citizenship of countries of our parental origin, in particular, Germany and Austria. And we're all very supportive of new generations of migrants and their traumas and difficulties. And we want to, to use some somewhat hackneyed phrase now, build back better for a more caring future. Next slide, please. So giving voice to the second generation has been difficult uh, given the traumas and silences about our backgrounds, but it's also been ultimately rewarding as we share a commitment to being supportive to new generations of migrants and their difficulties in making new lives in foreign places with language and cultural barriers. Uh, like the toppling of statues of racists, which has been <laughs> such a debating point, histories are made and remade. We are reconstructing our histories and our identities, and we too are history. We're all committed to gender, social and sex-based equality, human rights and anti-racism. We want to construct a better world for all our futures, 
not a world contorted and distorted by the current nasty zeitgeist of institutional or systemic racism and everyday humanity, inhumanity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam. There's so much to think about with what you've just presented and I'm sure there'll be many questions. Turning now to Marilyn Moose, who will now speak. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, for inviting us. I'm actually going to start off by talking briefly um, about my parents, to situate myself. So, when about 15 years ago, I checked out my parents' files at the National Archive, I was in for a big surprise. My mother had fled Germany in 1933 and was then investigated by three, if not four different national secret services. And after essentially escaping from the USSR in 1936, had ended up in Holloway prison in 1940 as a suspected spy. My father, despite all his denials, had been an active member of the German Communist Party, even probably acting for the Comintern in an Indian trade deal, had fled Germany on the night of the Reichstag fire, and in Britain became an economic advisor to the Free French. What I came to realize was that my difficult relationship with my parents was not a personal experience, so much as a product of their multi-layered trauma, although I avoid the word trauma, but it'll do. This led on to my books, which have been mentioned, a semi-autobiographical novel, The Language of Silence and Breaking the Silence, where I interviewed second generation people. And this work in turn has contributed to Miriam and my book, but what we have emphasized is that we wanted to put members of the second generation center stage. And within the context of the contributors' parents' past, our focus has been on how the contributors feel about themselves and position themselves politically in the now, what we call the zeitgeist. Our approach was therefore, therefore not a memory work. Um, some of this does, oh, I mean, some of what Miriam and I say overlap, but please bear with me. The contributors to this book were almost all born in England. This is typical of the parents of refugees who fled anti Semitism, but not of those who became refugees for political reasons, most of whom wanted to return to help rebuild East or West Germany and their children were therefore obviously born in Germany, mostly. Indeed, one of the contributors' parents who had been active members of the German Communist Party did indeed return to Germany after the war. Though my parents untypically chose to stay in the UK where I was born. Another group of refugees who are often forgotten who had fled East, are also represented here by one contributor who was born in and spent her first years in Egypt before her parents came here. The, contributor, the contributors are not necessarily typical for two other reasons. Firstly, we are a load of very success, generally successful middle class and middle class. And secondly, we were almost all women. Uh, that was partly choice. But so our concern was not the character of the second generation as a whole. As Miriam said, we don't we don't we don't see ourselves as typical. As readers of the book will observe, being second generation was not something we all readily embraced. And Miriam has already talked about some of the problems about this. So for instance, for me, being second generation only became a signifier when I started to unearth my family's past. And the same applies to other contributors. When young or young, youngish, many of us did not define ourselves primarily through be, being the children of refugees. And I mean, in fact, as Miriam said, there's a whole 
lot of upset and and disturbance about tapping into tapping into that that realization mm-hmm. um key themes emerged from the contributors most of the contributors parents though not all had fled because of the nazis extreme anti-semitic practices this raised the issue of what jewishness meant for the contributors as ever there was a wide spectrum of perspective. Most of the parents were Jewish within a cultural rather than a religious paradigm. Some of the contributors have been brought up by parents seeking assimilation outside a Jewish context, and they'd worked their way into seeing Jewishness as crucial to understanding who they are now. Others have been brought up to fully embrace their Jewishness, though of a cultural form. Jewishness was often understood and associated with morality, tolerance, and anti-Semitism. On the other hand, my parents, who were historically Jewish, they did not define themselves as Jewish, neither do I, but fled because of their active resistance to the Nazis, as did another contributor whose parents were not in any sense Jewish. So the contributor's attitudes to Jewishness varied significantly. An overlapping issue was the contributor's attitude to Zionism. While none of us were ardent Zionists, there was a clear spectrum from those who supported Israel, even if critically, because it offered a homeland to Jewish people, to to contributors who opposed the state of Israel as presently constituted and did not see it as a resolution for anti-Semitism. Another concern was around whether to claim German citizenship. I know not all the contributors were German, but there was a concern amongst those of us whose parents had been. The decision by Britain to leave the EU had intensified the question of whether to take up this long-standing German offer to the children of refugees from Nazism although this was more complex than I'm going into. Before Britain's decision to leave Europe, the contributors were not so concerned concerned about claiming German citizenship. Most of us have been brought up to be British or maybe English. Moreover, we'd grown up in a period after the Second World War where claiming German roots was certainly not popular. With a couple of exceptions, the respondents did not perceive themselves as Germans, Austrians, or whatever their parents' nationality had been. Parents spoke English to their children. The recent growth of the right in Britain and a desire to be able to stay as a European had raised the issue of German citizenship up our personal agendas. Again, there were divided opinions. On the one hand, one contributor was clear that her parents would not have wanted her to become German and therefore she would not apply. A few of the contributors struggled against a latent sense that they didn't want to belong to a country which had not wanted their parents. Then there were those who embraced the offer, seeing present day Germany as no longer a vessel for people who had been Nazis and wanted for themselves and sometimes their children a continuing right to live or work in Europe. One contributor highlighted the quandary of where do you come from? A question many of us have been asked repeatedly. Born in the UK, Miriam's actually already mentioned her, born in the UK, her parents had gone back to live in West Germany, but she had then returned to live in Britain as a young adult. There is no quick answer to where do you come from? which she writes about in her article. The ambiguity of our heritage was also represented when a couple of contributors, though born and bred in the UK, said they hesitated when ticking British in any survey or questionnaire. (laughs) All of the contributors were committed to reforming the present political system for the better. It is significant that all of us have found jobs either in the public sector or in some form of public service. We were teachers, lecturers, doctors, librarians, therapists, planners, etc. Almost none of us had become serious entrepreneurs working in the private sector or sought out work for financial gain. Mm-hmm. 
Moreover, we saw our jobs as a way of putting wrongs right. We taught English to refugees or worked in schools with a high level of refugee children or became actively involved in developing anti-racist teaching. One contributor who was a lawyer specialized in human rights. More broadly, there was a wide diversity in political responses. Almost all of us saw ourselves as feminists, though a couple of the contributors perceived a feminist perspective as dominant in their lives and generally. Almost all of us have been involved in anti-racism in one form or another, some in our workplaces, others organizing more widely. One contributor had campaigned against internment, but two or three of us put the greatest emphasis on the active transformation of the political system. A couple of the contributors at some point had belonged to the Communist Party, not me, Many of the participants saw themselves as broadly in support of the Labour Party, <laughs> dear, and were or are members. One contributor wrote about how painful this presently was, given the Labour leadership's targeting of the wrong people for anti-Semitism. Some of us wove together our past and present. One, one contributor who was a lecturer in social policy wrote a successful book about a local internee camp during the war, uh, Miriam's mentioned. My two most recent books have been about German anti-Nazis. A couple of the contributors have written about understanding the interaction between their present and their um, parents' past, a pursuit which is far more emotionally draining than it sounds. Yet all the contributors, though, I mean, you know, we have really been a successful lot. But if you read the articles, you'll find many of us still refer to feeling like outsiders or in some fashion othered. A couple of the contributors wrote about the present pandemic. The COVID pandemic feeds into an ex existential sense of threat to our being, which some of us had absorbed already from our parents. Though I imagine we have all been vaccinated between an incompetent neoliberal government and a highly adaptable virus, this pandemic feels like we are in the grasp of a potentially deadly and uncontrollable force, which there is little we can do about apart from hide away. The being in hiding is also resonant. For some, the COVID pandemic resurrects the specter of death especially given our age. This study is only too topical. We were all fearful at what is going to happen next under a post-Brexit populist and racist Tory government. None of the contributors appear to have supported the decision to leave Europe. Europe, including the UK, is facing the greatest refugee crisis since our parents. Millions are fleeing their homelands, a consequence of global conflict, persecution, and escalating climate change. Although, or maybe because, over a quarter of British people born in the UK today have at least one foreign-born parent, there's an increasing emphasis by the, by the state and some media, actually, on Englishness and othering, which is all too reminiscent. The contributors' wide range of political perspectives and how they understand themselves in the world today arises in part through their understanding of why their parents had to flee, whether because of politics or anti-Semitism or both. But what all the contributors held in common is wanting to stop a similar horror occurring again and a desire to put right the wrongs of this present highly unequal system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marilyn, and thank you so much for persevering. Bravo. We now move on to the next part of this evening's seminar, which is questions and answers. If you can hold out, both of you, that would be tremendous. Um, I must first mention, though, that this seminar, as Jane mentioned earlier, is being recorded 
So if you do not wish to appear in the film, please click on the camera icon at the bottom of your screen and ensure that the red line goes across it so that you don't appear. Otherwise, could you please unmute if you wish to ask a question, but ask it through the chat box because there are too many people to just ask you to hold up your hand. And if you could please kindly make your questions brief rather than long statements, if you could possibly, please. If you'll excuse me just one moment, I'll scroll through and see what questions we have. But those talks are so profound. The whole question of whether one is an emigre, an exile, a refugee, and the differential between them and how their children were sh lives were shaped is extremely profound. And one could speak and discuss this all evening. I don't actually see any questions. I can see one question, uh, which I don't know the answer to. Somebody's asked whether, uh, Tony Booth has asked whether parents, uh, any parents spoke Yiddish. Uh, and I'm, it wasn't an issue that came up because most of the parents uh, spoke German. They may also have spoken Yiddish, but we are, nobody alluded to uh, speaking Yiddish. And it could be uh, that that wasn't a huge concern for this group of uh, people. If I could add to that, there was also an element from people who I have in, uh, interviewed in the past, who, especially if they were, they were from acculturated families, looked down on the use of Yiddish uh, okay. and thought it was not the thing to do and didn't go to East London, for example, and to the Yiddish theatre, though it was still strong at that time. Uh, there's a lady called Janet here, who's raising a hand. What's your question, please, Janet? Could you please unmute? Yes, it wasn't a question. It was just in response to that. My mother's family came from Bodge or Lodz in um, what was then the Russian Empire in 1901 to Germany. And their main language was Yiddish. Yeah. So everybody, all my mother's uh, generation spoke Yiddish. And one of my uncles, he read the Neue Presse in, in Yiddish. I can remember that in the 1950s, going to see him in Paris, and he was re reading that. So there, there was a very strong Yiddish uh, connection there. Oh, that's, that's very interesting, because um, David Mazawa, who some of you may know or have heard of, is very keen on still promoting y Yiddish and klezma. So it's interesting that there is that different background. Thank you very much, Janet. You're welcome. You're welcome. Actually, I, can I uh, also add to it that I think, um, I don't know whether Gaby Weiner is here, but I do know that her father was involved in uh, Yiddish theatre in the, and she's written about that uh, in the East End of uh, London. And that's part of her Tales of Loving and Leaving. Are you here, Gaby? I'm not sure. Um, there's a question here from Sandra Acker, who's asking, how important is Britishness in the world, in the worldviews of the contributors? 
do you, what's your perspective of Britain today in the world? Well, I would say that uh, people were, on the whole, and Marilyn may want to come in too, or other contributors, on the whole, most people felt very critical now of mm. the way in which the British government were behaving. And so the question of how we felt about Britishness today was very clouded by our political critique of the uh, current governments and the governments throughout the, uh, at least the second decade of the 21st century. However, I think we were all brought up with a sense of gratefulness and some pride about uh, being uh, having a home, a refuge in uh, Britain. So the question of how we feel about Britain now is different from how we might have felt uh, when we were growing up. And Marilyn wants to come in too. Yeah, I mean, I I don't entirely agree with what you just said, Miriam, because I think that a lot of the contributors, there was always a certain a certain level of ambiguity about how far they defined themselves in terms of their per parents' nationality rather than, if you like, the country here, which they were born in. I mean, you know, I, I think that ambiguity run, runs through a lot of us. Um, also, I mean, I was brought up in a, in a family where being British was not celebrated, but, but, that's, but I think they're different things. Mm-hmm. We, we actually, have been, uh, actually uh, Claire has, uh, Angerson has put a note in the chat. She's one of the contributors. And it, it does speak to my experience too. Claire says that her mother refused to speak German at home. Yes. My father refused to speak German until I went to secondary school when I did learn German. But it, I, I learned it in a very... Uh, English way. I had no real experience of uh, regular daily German, although some of our other contributors were brought up with um, uh, speaking German at home and reading German uh, nursery books. For example, Maggie Gravel mentions that in her chapter about how she grew up on uh, children's, uh, small children's books in German. Uh, so the uh, diversity. Yes. Oh, sorry, Marilyn, go ahead. I agree. I agree. We were talked to in English. We may have had German nursery books, and then we didn't. But a lot of people, not me, in fact, but a lot of people did have relatives who had survived. I didn't have relatives who survived, but a lot of people did. And so, I mean, you know, I, I think that there was a, there was all, the, for many people, there was this consciousness that things were not simply British or were not simply English. You know, you had a grandmother, an uncle, a cousin or whatever, whatever it might have been, um, so that you, one was not the typical British family, you know, in one way or another. Yes. W would you say, uh, Miriam and Marilyn, that language is so closely bound up with identity, whether here in Britain as British-born women or in, in a broader sense, culturally, in general terms. And, to, and that, that's vital to an understanding of one's own culture or family culture, because as Marilyn has said, some people did survive and 
the only way they could speak to their relatives was in German or Czech or Polish. I think that's absolutely true. And it's certainly the case that I remember my German Jewish great aunt who lived in a Jewish refugee, a German Jewish refugee home in Manchester, who we used to visit on a regular basis. And my uh, father uh, spoke to her in German because her English was extremely poor. Mm. Uh, so, yes, it, it was part of our cultural heritage. And clearly, language is uh, a part of understanding one's identity, including, as many feminists have critiqued, the fact that language is very often gendered. And mm. that gives a sense of difference as well, not just for uh, refugees, but for people speaking different languages, the ways in which it's differently gendered. Yes, indeed. Yes. I'm conscious, sadly, of the time. Um, and there are some really interesting comments here, um, which I, I'm terribly sorry we don't have time to go through. But there's, there's one comment here that you, you might like to take up. I'll read it out. It's from Lynn Innes. My parents spoke German to each other and to relatives, but, oh, that's not the one. But they did not want us to learn it as my father thought it might lead to us going to Germany to work for a German company. And I wonder how, and there's another about, my impression is that in the United States, the second generation children have been encouraged to have a much stronger and continuing sense of their Jewish heritage than in Britain. Do you think this is the case? And if so, why? That's a, I know that's a long question, but I think that's it's a very, a very provocative one. I remember interviewing one lady who said that when she went to the USA, she was always introduced as a victim and she wanted to be introduced as a survivor. So it seems to me that there is perhaps a differential in terms of attitudes in the two different countries and it would be interesting to compare. It, it would be interesting to compare, uh, but we had so many uh, issues to compare and contrast that it was uh, the point of what we were doing was trying to bring together a group who in themselves were not typical, but try to spell out in what ways they, they felt it was important to uh, keep alive the sense of being a refugee and to help other uh, refugees in similar, but perhaps uh, different circumstances too. And we, uh, we, didn't, we didn't want to just do a compare and contrast study. We wanted to bring out the richness and diversity of our uh, backgrounds. And uh, I think Jeffrey Newman in one of the comments, which I read very quickly, asked uh, a question about were we implying that everybody was middle class? And we certainly weren't uh, implying that. Uh, and in fact, one or two of uh, our contributors felt extremely strongly about their uh, working class uh, backgrounds being important to them. Uh, but uh, they also felt uh, uh, that uh, what their, that their survival was a survival against the odds, and this was an important uh, issue to uh, elaborate. Mm. There, there is another aspect, and that's been covered here as well by Alice Bondi, um, 
during the war in Britain here, of course, refugees were strongly discouraged from speaking in any foreign language, which wouldn't be recognizable to Britain, necessarily to English people, whether it was Czech or Polish or German. Um, and consequently, for those children who grew up in Britain much earlier on, never learnt German. And, and that situation just perpetuated itself after the war. Um, and that perhaps is an important factor here, whereas in the States, perhaps the situation was different too. We have time perhaps just for one more brief question. I'm sorry, the time has flown by, I know. What was your question, please, Naomi? Uh, it was a very uh, simple one. Um, the, the group who were interviewed were obviously self-selected. In many ways, it was a friendship group or people who were friends of friends. Um, I was just wondering whether it's possible from this group to... This is not to, 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 to deny the interest and importance of the stories, which I found fascinating, but is it possible to extrapolate anything more general from the stories that were told? Uh, first of all, Nemi, uh, they, they were not interviewed. We asked people to write their own stories. Sorry, I understand them. that. Yeah, sorry, That's I realised that. Yeah. And... Uh, of course, we are atypical and we're not a social scientific sample and we didn't intend it to be a social scientific yeah. sample. We wanted to get at how our early heritage had affected and influenced in some way uh, what our, or not, our politics are today. And I think we can extrapolate from this that it's taken a long time across our lives for uh, the silences and secrecy of our backgrounds uh, to come to the fore. And as Marilyn said, most of us found out most about our parents after they died. Very few of us uh, knew much about then we knew something but we a lot of the issues were hidden so. uh, in uh, it, and we found a lot of them out from uh, for example going to the national archives as Marilyn has mentioned it was quite an eye-opener to some of us to f discover a lot of our history so I think that's the important point and it may well be true not just of people who are uh, children of refugees or second generation, that when you're growing up, your parents don't want to say everything about their backgrounds to you. But some of our backgrounds were particularly poignant and important for future generations. Thank you very much, Miriam and Marilyn. And I hope that in a way, producing this book has brought you closer to your own parents and to an understanding of them, as well as an appreciation of your different cultures and backgrounds. And thank you very much indeed for speaking this evening.